Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Welcome, everyone. This is Stuart Jordan, your host for today's Attitude Magazine ADHD Experts broadcast. Today, we're going to be talking about seven ways to be more productive and crush it at work. Our guest for today is Alan Brown, an ADHD productivity coach and host of Crusher TV. Alan is the creative force behind ADD Crusher videos. Alan himself was undiagnosed for decades, and his untreated ADHD manifested in underachievement, drug abuse, and much worse. And once diagnosed, he found it difficult to learn coping strategies from books, so he developed his own unique brand of brain hack strategies while building a successful advertising career and several startups. He's a featured presenter at ADHD conferences in the U.S. and Europe and hosts his own weekly online TV show, www.crushertv.com, where he and his guest experts help unleash the power of your brain. You can see more about Alan and reach him through his website, addcrusher.com. Today, folks, Alan will be talking about setting priorities and how to attack them, recognizing your strengths and weaknesses and planning your work accordingly, how to quiet down your busy mind, how to learn how to stay on task and avoid distractions, and whether to ask for or how to ask for workplace accommodations. Uh, Thank you, Alan, for joining us again today. We're always glad to have you here to share your thoughts. Stuart, thank you so much for having me here. It's great to be back here. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, tuning in with us. Uh, I'm looking forward to this presentation, and um, this is really important to me, uh, productivity at work, crushing it at work, uh, because part of my little title here, as you can see, is Mess to Success entrepreneur in addition to being an ADHD and productivity coach and I created the ADD Crusher videos and I host my TV show every week. I really like to emphasize the mess of success because I really have lived the worst and the best of ADHD from massive underachievement in school. I almost didn't graduate from high school. Uh, it took me 10 years to get a four-year degree, years of drug addiction and, and even crime. You don't want to know. Uh, and, but then even after getting myself cleaned up at the end of my 20s, it's kind of a lost decade there, uh, I got a job, an entry-level job in the advertising business, uh, and I was all stoked and ready to go, and I jumped in there with both feet, and I started working hard because I had some you know, eight years to catch up on or something like that. But I was totally floundering early in my career. Um, for six years, I busted my tush working evenings, weekends, um, giving it everything I had. And I just was getting very, very average returns in terms of promotions and raises. But then about six years into that underwhelming career, somebody gave me a gift. It was an audio book because they they knew I I wasn't so good at reading. And it was uh, Deepak Chopra's Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. And uh, there's there's a a lot of woo-woo in there, you could say, but there's also a lot of practical stuff about how to quiet your mind uh, sort of on demand, how to open the window to creativity. And just those two sort of things that I learned, which I call brain hacks, because you're really just flipping a switch in your mind to change the way you view something or just just altering the the train of your thought. I was actually able to start to accelerate my career and more and more people were calling on me to help with brainstorming for new products and and, and packaging and and naming ideas and stuff. And I also got uh, another gift of uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, of course, the audio version, and learned a lot of powerful things in there that really changed the way my brain started to operate. And not long after that, I got the diagnosis of ADHD. I was 36 years old. And uh, as many of you out there uh, have experienced that, you know, can be a very uh, shocking thing for you when you get that diagnosis. But for most of this, it is, oh, my goodness, thank you. It's explained so much. And once I had this diagnosis, I now knew that my brain was different. And I knew why it was that these brain hacks I was starting to use were really starting to get me traction. And, of course, with proper treatment now, 
I really could double down on this. And I started to develop more of these brain hacks and then, of course, started curating from other uh, people, um, other great uh, thinkers, uh, more brain hacks. And I went in the space of really two, two and a half years, I went from a kind of a lowly level executive. Again, I was 36 years old. I mean, all my peers were like, you know, 27. Um, I went from five figures, mid five figures, which in Manhattan, this is a big uh, New York ad agency I worked at. Five figures was, you know, practically poverty level. And in New York, you can't really live on that. Um, but within two, two and a half years, I was, I was five. I went to six figures. I was made vice president, management director, and I was uh, named employee of the year of the largest office of the biggest ad agency in the country at that time. And in that, that year uh, that I was uh, employee of the year, I, in my spare time, I co-founded a startup that in my spare time that was later sold for eight figures. So you do the math on that. Um, this is why I say mess to success. And if, believe me, I am not the sharpest hack in the box. So if I can do this stuff, anybody out there can do it. So I'm now I'm retired from the advertising business. I just do coaching, uh, public speaking and, and hosting of the Crusher TV. So I, again, I'm proof that with some solid strategies and some greater self-awareness, you can indeed crush it at work and get more stuff done. Uh, and again, trust me, I was underachieving and I want to speak to this underachievement uh, thing again. Uh, which, you know, this word is sadly one of the words most associated with us ADDers, uh, not only at work, but in school work. And the potential is there. The energy is there. The desire is there, right? It's not like we're not willing to do the work, um, but we just can't seem to get out of our way. And this is just such a frustrating thing for us adults with ADHD um, and teens and, and young people. Um, so I'm going to share seven of these uh, strategies that I used to really propel my uh, career and change change my life for the better. Uh, just very briefly, I just want to make sure everyone understands the gravity of this underachievement because I, I'm also a, uh, an advocate for undiagnosed uh, adult, uh, uh, people with ADHD, uh, particularly adults, because 85% of the 9 million adults with ADHD in the U.S. alone, 85% of them don't know they have it. So this underachievement results in a lot of awful, awful things, as you see, as you get toward the bottom of this little chart here. So, again, this is not this is not for nothing, as we say in Jersey. Uh, this is serious stuff. And uh, to be able to have some tools to help you through this, um, it can be very life changing. So let's get to some action. And uh, we'll start with a quote from my friend uh, Bruce Lee, who says, knowing is not enough. We must apply. Willing is not enough we must do. And the reason I put this up in practically every presentation that I do is that, you know, here we are, uh, hats off to everyone here for signing up for this webinar and attending, um, 474 of you, bless you. Um, and we pat ourselves on the back and we should. We also, we may go to conferences, we may buy books, we need audio books, um, and we can get some self-satisfaction of that. But if we are not taking action, based on the things that we are learning when we're doing these things, next week is not going to be any different from today. Next month will not be any different from this month. So what I'm going to be sharing is, is generally seven uh, strategies, and I want you to do something very important. I want you to forget them all. Pregnant pause, except for two, maybe two, one or two. And what I mean here is, as you're taking notes, and hopefully you're taking notes is what I go through this, just the things that really resonate with you, where you say, oh, man, this really makes sense. I'm going to try to circle that one. And then make a plan, put it something in your calendar, make it write a sticky note, just start to put it into action this afternoon, tonight, first thing tomorrow morning, so that a week from now, you might be able to say instead of, yeah, I saw this great uh, webinar of this guy, Alan Brown, is really entertaining, versus, yeah, I started doing this thing that I learned, and it's actually making a difference, all right? That's my preamble. I uh, hope I'm not beating a dead horse, but uh, this is really important. And when, when somebody gives you 10 things to do, <laughs> you're not likely to do any of them. If you just choose one or two things and focus on them, you actually start to see a difference. You can always come back to the printout or watch the uh, webinar again if you're ready to pick up something else. All right, let's go. Let's start with feeding your brain. Uh, the first thing that I teach in my ADD Crusher uh, virtual coaching videos is diet. Um, and it's the first thing that I talk about with my new clients is what are, how are you feeding your brain? 
Because, folks, this thing pictured here is not breakfast. And this is not coffee, nor is it hydration. Uh, yet, Americans have these terrible diets, and I know Europeans too, and uh, folks down under, um, they're not doing a whole lot better. But and it's not to say that everybody out there is eating a Cinnabon, which, by the way, has more calories than a Big Mac. But still, if you are putting sh a lot of sugar uh, and simple carbohydrates in your stomach in the morning, you are, you are begging for your ADHD to just feel worse because you don't get any sustained mental uh, stamina from these things. And I can't tell you how many people I saw in, in, my, in my advertising career these are definitely undiagnosed ADD or so there's a lot of them in the, uh, AD, in the advertising business. They're walking around with a jug of Mountain Dew, or they are just constantly uh, crunching on, on uh, cheese doodles and Cheetos, things that are giving them a quick little burst of energy, uh, mental energy, but then it burns off and they, and they crash. And this is why uh, my first of four important diet mantras is sugar sucks. You know, just carbs kill, protein is power, omegas and omega, and we'll talk about those in a second. But sugar sucks because it is glucose, which is the fuel for your brain. But when you ingest it alone, it just, it, it crosses the blood-brain barrier very quickly, and it just gets used up quickly and burns up. That's why you crash. That's why you always reach for more of something that's sweet. You just keep reaching for more potato chips, which are carbs, simple carbs, and carbs kill. Not literally, but they act just like sugar in terms of your ADHD brain. You don't get any sustained uh, mental stamina from them. Protein, on the other hand, is mental power. So if you can get a 30-gram protein hit in your stomach when you leave the house or when you arrive at work, you are more likely to be able to power uh, until 11, 11.30 a.m. or whatever time it is that, that you might hit that late morning uh, wall. Whereas with sugar and carbs as your breakfast, I used to eat a croissant for breakfast for crying out, like croissant with butter. I thought that was breakfast. It's not. And no wonder at, at, at 9.45 a.m. I was, my brain was just going blank. Get protein in you and make sure that there is protein in every one of your meals. Uh, that is mental fuel and it extends the delivery curve of the glucose uh, that powers your brain. Omegas are mega. There's been a lot of research done with, on this. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. There's been some research that is a little contradictory, but on balance, uh, the omega-3s in uh, fish uh, and also krill oil is beneficial to our cognition, acuity, etc. cetera. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get that from a, a, a great uh, source, uh, but here are, are a few other Simple things, this is my little bonus I call Zim B6, and that is zinc, iron, um, magnesium, uh, and vitamin B6. Uh, so Zim B6, if you are getting enough of these every day, whether it's hopefully from all your foods with a lot of greens and a lot of uh, protein, um, this is going to help you. These are four things that have been shown by and large to help with uh, cognition and other mental things. Vitamin D and sun, uh, it are, a lot of research is coming out about how uh, these can improve cognition uh, and memory. And um, what's interesting, though, is that you know we can't be walking around in the sun and, and getting suntans all the time to get our D, so we need to get it from food and also from supplements. Um, but many of us are, uh, have a vitamin D deficiency. There was this recent study that showed that 70% of the residents of sunny Tucson, Arizona, have a vitamin D deficiency. So even if you're getting outside a little bit, make sure that you're getting outside enough. Obviously, you want to use screen, sunscreen when there's a lot of sun, but you can also use supplements. I say here little fish because uh, we just did a show on brain toxins and mercury. Did you know that two cans of tuna fish have twice the weekly recommendation of mercury intake, intake uh, per the EPA? I've got nothing against Starkist or Bumblebee or any of these tuna brands, but man, tuna are big fish and they eat a lot of little fish. And over the course of their lives, they accumulate and store this mercury. That's why swordfish, which is a big predator fish, has so much mercury. You've got to stay away from big fish. Go for little fish. That's where you can get a lot of natural omegas and other benefits um, without the mercury. I eat sardines all the time. They're awesome, very nutritious and uh, uh, they have uh, little or no mercury. All right, so those are some keys 
um, to making sure that your brain is properly fueled. Now, um, once you've got your brain fueled, uh, you got to make a plan. Because as my friend, not really my friend, but uh, our friend Jim Rohn says, if you don't design your own life plan, chances are you'll fall into someone else's plan. And guess what they have planned for you? Not much. Now, this is, of course, true of one's life, but it's also true of every single day. This is one of the things that AV gears just don't do. We don't pause, right? You probably heard about the power of the pause. One of the things that we don't know how to do is pause. And the most important pause you can possibly take is the one at the beginning of the day or the night before to just stop and say, hey, what am I going to be doing today? Because indeed, either you run the day or the day runs you. And boy, don't we ADDers know it. Without a plan, we're not only at the mercy of others and their agendas, we are at the mercy of our own distracted minds. These Our minds are powerfully attracted to that which does not move us forward. Our minds want to go to the thing that's easier, that, that just feels like productivity, but it's not. So what must we do? Well, the unsexy truth is you got you, you to gotta get a planner, um, some form of planner or calendar. Now, I know what you're saying. You're, if, you, if you don't use a planner, you're probably saying, you know what? I've tried them. Uh, and after three days or after three weeks, it just ends up collecting dust on a shelf. Um, and the two re biggest reasons these ha this happens is that, one, the planner we get is too damn complex, right? It's just got a bunch of button bells and whistles, and it's not simple enough for our ADHD brain. And then, two, we don't ritualize it. Now, this is absolutely key. When you ritualize something like brushing your teeth, you don't need any willpower in order to do it every day. You don't need willpower to go brush your teeth. You just do it. Uh, so this is the key with getting and using a planner or calendar. Again, I know it's really unsexy, but this is what every successful person does. If you actually, if you watch uh, Shark Tank, you'll notice that every one of the people on Shark Tank has a notebook, not a little cheesy pad of paper, not a bunch of stick, but a notebook that they carry with them all the time. Uh, Sir Richard Branson says he would not have been able to, to succeed with any of his companies without his planner that he keeps with him all the time. So, um, and then making the actual plan. All you need is five minutes. Again, think about it. We, years, we don't pause. We don't stop. Um, you know, if you just were able to, to pause for five minutes in the morning, that is enough to allow you to shift your mind out of the typical ADHD, that constant state of overwhelm that we all feel, and into what neuropsychologists call pause and plan, which is the opposite of fight or flight. Pause and plan is where you're relaxed, you're sitting there, your, your mind is open, and it's able to actually think, you know what, here are the things that I need to work on today, or here's what my day is going to look like. Oh, that's right, i got to do so-and-so. Now, speaking of which, and this is the big key here, um, your three biggies. The research has this back, backed up big time, and we're going to get into that in just a second. But just choose three biggies. And all you need is five minutes to just identify three biggies and write them down. The three things that if you could only do three things today, what would they be? Sometimes it's tough for us to prioritize at 80 years. I get as 80 years, I get that. But um, there are other tricks for that we don't have time for here. Um, but um, if you don't identify three biggies, you're going to be on somebody else's plan. Now, let's to put some asterisks here. So let's look at some research. Everything I teach is, is evidence-based. So um, to the to-do that is assigned a time and a place has 53% greater chance of being done. This is what research tells us. So when you just decide, well, I'm going to put this in my planner for tomorrow at 3 o'clock and I will be at my office and that's what I'll do, you have just increased by 53% the odds of the thing getting done. Uh, and then, of course, the opposite, if you don't uh, put it in a, in a planner account. Uh, second, here are the evidence-based benefits of just sitting for five minutes and thinking about your day. You get better time management, more effectiveness, better memory, and less stress. How's that for just spending five minutes? Uh, and then three biggies is optimal. If you set more than three things on your to-do list for the day, the odds of accomplishing even one decline. And once you get to 11 things that you've identi identified as, well, i got to do these today, your odds of accomplishing even one of them goes down to about 0.1%. That's what the research tells us. All right. So you got to make a plan. You also got to know your strong and weak times. There's a lot of talk in the productivity world these days about time management versus energy management. And uh, managing your energy is key for 80 years. For instance, 
we all have strong and weak times of the day, right? Some of us are really good in the morning, others are great at night. And as such, you want to be doing your tough stuff in your strongest times, right? So you got to identify your strong and weak times. If you don't know them, just as we're talking right now, make a note right now and circle it to say, let me give some thought later on tonight or today about what my strong and weak times are. If you don't identify those, you're going to be constantly frustrated by struggling with your tough stuff in your weak times. That's, that is so discouraging. And this is one reason why we hated years get this, 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 this toxic thought that I just can't do that. I don't, I'm not able to do that kind of thing. It's because we are so often trying to do tough stuff in our weakest times. What's just as bad is doing our easy stuff in our strong times because you're, you're squandering the opportunities for big victories on tough stuff. So um, this also, by the way, correlates with your willpower. There's been a lot of research done um, in the last few years about willpower. And um, this is one of the top researchers in the area, Kerry Kelly McGonigal, who wrote a book about it. Knowing how and when you're likely to give in allows you to support yourself and avoid the traps that lead to willpower failure. And your weak times are when you are more likely to not have willpower. Um, it's also, by the way, when you're tired when you are hungry or when you are angry. Those are also three times when your willpower is going to be weak. So again, listen to your body, listen to your strong and weak times, and you will be able to uh, be much, much more effective in what you do. All right. Here's one of my favorites. Uh, I call it shut up in your mind. I grew up with a lot of Italian guys back in Jersey, and uh, I wanted to find a way to talk about meditation that wasn't kind of woo-woo and wasn't off-putting at all. And shut up in your mind is my way of of articulating that. Um, you know, we are not all hyper, physically hyperactive, but we are all mentally hyperactive. And this is stressful um, because, uh, you know, this constant spinning, you know, our brains are always going, we're ideating, we're worrying about the past, we're worrying about the future, our minds are going off chasing squirrels, etc. And this constant spinning is exhausting. Uh, and it steals energy from tough tasks. So if you've been ruminating on something for 20 minutes, and then you say, okay, now i got to start to work on that tough email that I've been meaning to write, you don't have any gas left for that. So being aware of the stuff that's in your mind and knowing that that voice that's running back there, that's actually not you. Because if you can keep calm and be the witness, which is to just stop once in a while and listen to what that voice is saying, you will realize that that voice really isn't you, that it is most of the time your ego. Because if you actually were to sit down for 10 minutes and just listen to the stuff that comes in and out of your mind, you will notice that it's mostly worries about the past, worries about the future, and a lot of petty judgments about this and that. Oh, my guy's shoes are terrible. Oh, my goodness, my hair looks awful today. Um, boy, I really didn't like that person so-and-so. So that's, look, it's, it's petty, and, but we all do it, and, it, and it's okay. But when you're aware of it, you can start to control it a little bit. And, um, again, by observing the content, you will be much more attuned to it. And this also allows you, once you start listening to the voice inside, it allows you to just take short breaks and go, you know what? My mind is just going bats right now. So what I do when I have to sit down and do work on a tough thing is I will just Quiet. I'll just sit down, put my hands in my lap, sit in a comfortable position, and just shut up on my mind. Meaning, I'll just close my eyes and just listen to the stuff going on. Okay, there's that thought. All right, there's this thought. And just kind of kick them out. And you just give yourself a little bit of a rest. You're not going to be able to completely quiet your mind because that does take a little bit of practice. But you can, you can just take yourself off of autopilot just by observing your thoughts. And here's another tip. Uh, pay attention to your nose hairs. It may sound a little kooky, but um, if you were to actually think about your nose hairs as you breathe out through your nose, and just this just sounds a little silly, but just listen, just feeling them, imagine they're kind of fluttering outward and then fluttering inward as you breathe in. That very act of doing that, just thinking about your nose hairs or your breath for that matter, takes you out of whatever rumination or anxiety you were in because you're just becoming present. That's the power of the now. The now is where there are no problems. So, for instance, we look at our to-do list, and there are probably a bunch of, quote-unquote, problems on it. Oh, my goodness, i got to do this. i got to do that. 
oh my goodness, I forgot all about it. I was supposed to do this other thing and then these other things. And right, this is, this is the constant state of overwhelm. But the reality is, if you just stop, shut up your mind, and or, or just listen to your breathing or pay attention to your nose here, you will realize that, well, right now, none of my to-dos are a problem because if they were, if any of them were, I would actually be handling it, right? If I got a text right now from my sister who's on the Jersey Turnpike and she's stuck and it's raining and her phone battery's about to die and she needs help, that's a problem. And I'd have to excuse myself from this, this uh, webinar and say, folks, I've got to handle this. Please pardon me. But we tend to regard all our to-dos that are undone as all problems that are, that are attacking us and beating up on us. Kind of rightfully so, because we have let these things sit on our to-do list and they're all late and all that. But if you were to, if we here we are together on this webinar, there are no problems because if there were a problem, we wouldn't be here on this webinar. So if you can take that being in the now mentality, when you sit down in front of your to-do list and just relax, you can just feel your shoulders start to relax a little bit when you go, okay, yeah, there are a lot of to-dos here, but here in the now, there's no real problem. So let me actually calmly now choose something to work on. Maybe I can identify my three biggies, et cetera. So this is a really powerful thing. This is Eckhart Tolle, by the way, um, a wonderful book called The Power of Now, and an even better audio book called The, the um, Practicing the Power of Now, I think it's called. Okay, so that's an important thing for us 80 years to do. One of the things that we do, because our mind is going 80 bazillion miles an hour, is we multitask. And this is a big problem for ADD years. It's a problem for everybody in society. In the ADD Crusher videos, I make the bold statement that multitasking is for suckers. But it's not just me that's saying that. It's also Yale, MIT, Stanford, and a bunch of other top research institutions who have all looked into, into multitasking and found that, uh, in a nutshell, multitasking makes you much less efficient. I'm sure by now you've heard some of this research, you've heard in the news or whatever, but we still yet, we still think that, and, and by the way, it just drives me bats when somebody says, oh, one of the great you know, benefits of ADD is that you can multitask. That is absolute turdness. I, don't know, I just think I just made up a word, but you can tell how kind of <laughs> aggravated I get about that. Um, we can't uh, multitask any better than anybody else. In fact, we can probably are more susceptible to multitasking and it costs us more as a result. So let's let's get beyond that. Um, let's talk about instead the power of single tasking, right? And I know what you might be likely to say, which is, you know, Alan, single tasking, you know, how the heck am I gonna do any single tasking? I'm an ADD or I, I can't I can't stay focused long enough to write a stick. Well here is how you can outwit your ADHD brain and set yourself up for a single tasking session. And um, I say single tasking session, this is one of the single most important things you can do to crush it at work. Start thinking in terms of single tasking, whereas I'm gonna block off some time and I'm just gonna work on this one thing. Just by framing that in your mind, uh, you are gonna be able to get more stuff done. So how do you single task as an ADD? -er? Well, take a blank, post-it or a sticky note, just a big blank one. Take that and then choose one of your three biggies or maybe it's some other to-do that you need to get working on. Ideally, it's, it's one of your biggies that you're going to single task on. And then you're going to write at the top of that sticky to-do, meaning this becomes your new to-do list. This, what this does is it allows you to, for a moment, forget about your other many to-dos. There's a thing called the Zygarnik effect where our many undone to-dos actually pollute our minds and drag us down. It beats up our mental acuity, our mental stamina, because in our subconscious, we know that those things are sitting there undone, and it, it ruins our, our mentality and ability to focus on the thing in the present. So what you're doing here is you're subverting the zygonic effect and your ADHD brain by saying, okay, I've got this one to-do. You write to-do list, and then that one thing, write it there. And then what I do is I make sure I'm working on a clean service. Right now, I'm in my TV studio, and it's a very clean white surface with nothing on it other than my laptop, a couple of notes, bag of nuts, some water, and of course my laptop. Out in my office, I have two IKEA tables, crappy, I don't know, $25 tables, white. 
And when I sit down to work on something tough, that surface has nothing on it but my laptop, that sticky that says to do with that one thing on it, and my phone, which is set to a timer. That's the only reason my phone's there. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then my laptop. And this allows me to look at that one to do and say, and I literally say this, I say it, you to do, you are dead. You're a dead man because it's just you and me and my brain and this laptop. And here we go. So if you can take this kind of little ritual um, uh, and include in that ritual, making sure that you, I mentioned that I have nuts right here next to me, right here. Here's my bag of nuts. Can you hear them? I have a bag of nuts and some dried fruit. And that's the optimal uh, uh, way to keep your protein and glucose going. So make sure there's something in your stomach when you're going to single task. Then get in the now, right? Just say, okay, there is no problem here in the now. If, there, if one of my other to-dos were a problem, I would be attending to it. And I'm not. So that means that there's no problem here in the now. That means that I can just work on this one thing without worrying about the, anything else. Set a timer. It could be for 90 minutes, which is what I usually do because I'm doing a lot of writing. It could be for 20 minutes. It could be for 60 minutes. Depends on what the task is. It could be for five minutes. A lot of times, you don't, you don't start on something because it's such a big bear and you're like, oh, you know, I don't know how to do that. I'm just going to start it tomorrow maybe. These are things we tend to procrastinate, procrastinate most on. But if you were to just set a timer for five minutes and say, you know what? I'm just going to work on it for five minutes. I don't care if I completely fail. That's a powerful procrastination hack right there. So set a timer, whether it's 5, 10, 20, or 90 minutes, uh, set a timer, and then crush it. If I were to print out one page from this presentation, it would be this one, and I would hang it up right above my computer or my desk at work or at home. This is killer. You start single tasking, you, oh, that is the most powerful anti-ADHD medicine you can have. All right, now, you have sat down to do a single tasking session, and here's the problem. We get a text from a friend and we want to return, you know, first, let me just, let me just respond to that text. Your email alert goes off. Ding. Uh, you remember that there's that other thing that you want to do, or you remember that, oh my goodness, I, I, I remember somebody told me about this video on YouTube with, with these macaca monkeys riding dwarf goats. And, and you know how I feel about macaca monkeys and dwarf goats. And I, if there's a video that has the two of them together, I, I have to go look at that now. You, you get where I'm going with this. There are always going to be distractions. and much of the stress that people feel doesn't come from having too much to do. It comes from not finishing what they've started. So just setting up that single tacking session is no guarantee you're going to get anything done uh, because you're going to get distracted. And especially we 80 deers. I'm going to get into more of that in just a second. So there's a wonderful quote from Robert Burns, the uh, Scottish poet that you've heard the best laid plans of mice and men often go right. Well, with us 80 deers, always go awry. So we can be all set to go. We've got our protein. We've got, we're in the now. We've got our one to do and we sit down and then the phone rings, the boss knocks, the kids uh, yell, the dog, whatever those million things are, um, we remember this or that and we get derailed. Um, and then we also live in an ADHD world, right? Where our gadgets are constantly uh, going off. We're expected to be uh, quote unquote on all the time. And when you add the ADHD world that we live in, plus your own ADHD, again, as we say back East, oy vey. Uh, and we fail, what uh, contributes to this is that we fail to make hard distinction, uh, distinctions amongst various thoughts and things. Uh, and this is how you get around this. Now I wanna, we're gonna play some video here and knock on wood that the video will work with, with the sound. But um, this is the single most powerful brain hack that I use and that I share with clients. And I've got people who email me all the time about, holy crap, Alan, thank you for that one. Or people that I'll see at a conference who learned this three years ago say, I still use that thing every day. And it's called labeling. And you just need three labels. And I think the video comes up now. So ADD crusher, five ways, five minutes a day, crush your ADD. Fact. Linear left brainers, non ADDers, prioritize things based on what's most important. Makes sense, right? We ADDers prioritize things based on what's most interesting at the moment. This is why we are easily pulled away from major important tasks and into low priority wastes of time that are more titillating. Labeling, labeling important tasks and potential diversions. You need three labels. One, what I'm doing now. 
Two, BS, that is not what I'm doing now. And three, it's important, but not what I'm doing now. The way to get engaged in an important task is to determine forcefully that this is what I'm doing now. The way to keep from getting pulled away from that thing is to guard your mind's open window with a labeling gun for things that are not what I'm doing now. All right. So hopefully now you can see what we're doing. We're making that clear distinction between, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what I've decided to do. And everything else is either BS that I'm not doing now, like thinking about going and making small talk at the, at the water cooler um, or responding to that text that is not urgent or, um, you know what, I'm just going to send that email to so-and-so, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all relatively BS compared to what I've decided to do now. And then there's the other kind of not what I'm doing now is things that are important, which you might say, well, Alan, you know, when something important, I, you know, comes up, I got to do that. Well, no, not if it's not urgent. There are always going to be important things. So for instance, your boss could come knocking on a door and say, hey, I want to, you know, uh, talk with you about blah, 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 blah. To which you can say, hey, you know what? I'm actually working on this thing uh, for you. <laughs> um, can we talk in 20 minutes? Um, let's go have lunch in 20 minutes and talk about it. No, no, unless, again, if it's an urgent thing, the boss isn't going to say, no, you jerk. Um, in fact, people will respect you more. Um, I always put a note uh, when I was working in, a, in an actual office. I would put a note on my door that says, All right now I am single tasking on something. Please come back in 30 minutes or at whatever time. Um, so, again, even if it's important, if it's not urgent, it's still not what you're doing now. Now, if you can make a habit of this, you will find that your to-do list starts shrinking big time. I assure you, when you start single tasking and then employing this brain hack, um, you will find five minutes. I'll go ahead and let this play. I made it exercise. A little weird, perhaps, but it'll be fun. And it actually will help you learn to label thoughts and things so you can stay on task with what you're doing now. This will help you make it a habit. You sit down to pay your bills. Paying your bills is what you're doing now. But soon there will be distractions, each of which you must label. Yes, that is not what you're doing now or important but not what you're doing now. For starters, oh, your dog wants to go out and play. Label it. Hey, your cousin needs help paying her bills and wants you to come over. She'll buy the beer. Label it. Your ex from 10 years ago comes out of nowhere texting you to catch up on life because she just got divorced. Label that one. Hey, the Dalai Lama is calling. You have no idea why, but you got to label it. Is it what you're doing now? Um, so you get the idea. By the way, that's kind of fun little cartoon. Actually, believe it or not, started to carve some new neural pathways in your brain. Because now when you leave this presentation, you will perhaps have a different way of thinking about, well, I'm working on this now. And as I was saying before, I got hair trigger on, on playing the videos. If you can make this a habit where every time you sit down and start working on something and then the text pops up or the email goes off or whatever it is, and you can say to yourself, you know what, that's not what I'm doing now. You are going to be fighting your ADHD in such a powerful way. And again, I, this is the single most powerful uh, hack that I teach. Uh, it, it is probably responsible for 25% of my net worth. I, I No exaggeration. Now, this is the one thing I want you to walk away with if, if it resonates with you. I'm going to go quickly through this uh, this last thing and then a little bonus thing I want to cover. I want to leave some time for Q&A. If by chance we run out of time and you do have a question, come find me at addcrusher.com and I'll be happy. You can find the email address there to, to get in touch with us and I'll be happy to uh, to uh, interact with you there. Okay, so let's talk about screen sucking. This is a big one. You may have heard this term. It was coined by Dr. Ned Hollowell, um, and it refers to any kind of overuse of screens, TV, your phone, your tablet, your computer. Um, and, um, you know, this is a big, big time waster for us. And, and I, I always say if there's one thing we ADDers never have enough of, it's time. So if there's one thing we should never be wasting, it's 
you know, fill in the blank. Uh, yet we do so. We allow our gadgets to um, take over uh, much of our time. And by the way, the, the way Facebook and Instagram and other social media platforms are designed, particularly in the mobile uh, realm, they're designed to be addicted. They're designed for you to continue to scroll with your thumb or with your cursor to keep taking in more and more. It recognized that and also recognized the fact that we get dopamine hits from this. So here's why we are doing this. Well, everybody's doing it, right? Everybody's on Facebook. Everybody's on Snapchat. Um, I need a break, right? A lot of times we're working on a, on a tough thing. And we go, you know what? I need a little break. So we'll take a quote unquote break, which is actually not a mental break. And we will engage in social media or searching something silly on YouTube or frankly, uh, watching TV, which this, in and of itself is not a horrible thing. But when you're watching two and three hours of it every day, and then the next day you're complaining that you don't have time to do everything you need to do. Um, hello. Um, we also get dopamine hits from this. This is what what you know, I don't believe in, you know, evil conspiracies of corporations or anything like that. But, you know, the folks at Facebook know that you are getting dopamine hits when someone likes one of your things, when you post a new profile picture and somebody likes it. Or, by the way, you also get dopamine hits when you delete an email because you get a little sense of accomplishment. Uh, speaking of that, this is called pseudo productivity. Uh, we often are on our gadgets or, or spending time in our email inbox because we think it is productivity. We think that going in there and deleting a bunch of emails or responding to a few emails is productivity. And nine times out of 10, it's not. It's just make work. It's busy work. It's pseudo productivity. And that's a whole other subject on its own. But the more conscious you can get of this kind of stuff, um, the more you're going to be able to fight it. And it's a tough fight. I don't expect anybody is going to be able to make a breakthrough with this right away. But just start to investigate this, these facts that, you know, just because everybody else is spending X amount of time on their phones, you know, when you ride the subway in New York or when you ride a bus or when you're, you know, even out at a, at a concert for crying out loud, people are on their gadgets. Just because everybody else is on their gadgets doesn't mean, in fact, if you're an ADD or you should be spending less time on your gadget, you should be getting busy doing something to move things forward. All right. Enough of that. Um, just a real quick thing on apps. One quarter of the da of downloaded apps are used only one time. One in four apps. More than half are used fewer than five times. And only one third of apps are used 10 times or more. So let's do a reality check here with regard to apps, because we ADDers think that apps are going to be an easy solution. And I know that there are a lot of apps that are really amazing that help people, uh, especially when they are um, used properly and used consistently. But they do require work to, to come to learn them. Um, they end up often being a waste of time if they are not real productivity apps. Uh, and you do get a psychological hit, and in this case, a negative hit. Because when you download another app and you think that this is going to provide some solution, then it turns out not providing a solution. You're like, you know what? It's the same old story. I can't do anything. Nothing's going to help me. Even this productivity app is not. So you take a negative psychological hit every time you download an app. So my philosophy is forget the apps. The most powerful app you have is right between your ears. And if you can use even a couple of the things we've been talking about here, you are going to see a difference in your life. And that's not a bunch of selling yada, yada, yada. So when you're, when you're thinking about, uh, um, you know, apps and uh, social media stuff, question its role. What is the role of this uh, Facebook or Instagram in my life? Is it, is it actually helping my career? Uh, if it's not, let's do less of it. Count the negatives of it. Um, one, of, one of the negatives, of course, is the, the, the negative vibes we're getting because our, 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 uh, our uh, social media are now uh, news feeds. It's not just social media. It's not just, you know, happy birthday. It's now what's happening in uh, politics. And that becomes very negative stuff. We can get into the physiology of that. Calendar it. How about this? How about setting a calendar date with yourself? You know what? From 4.30 to 5 o'clock today, I am going to just do nothing but Facebook or YouTube or whatever it is. And that's cool because now you're corralling it. Um, and if you can stick to something like that, you're going to see productivity gains right away. All right. A very quick word on work accommodations, sort of a bonus thing. And because we're talking about uh, crushing it at work, I wanted to share this um, because many of you may be asking yourselves, well, should I be disclosing my ADHD? First of all, you are entitled to work accommodations. And most of the countries uh, where the folks here are from, um, the laws have it so that you are able to say, hey, you know what? I, I have uh, a learning disability and I need 
um, help. But you don't need to reveal your ADHD diagnosis. This, by the way, is, is how uh, Dr. Hallowell um, uh, sees it, too. He, he doesn't suggest that you run to your boss and say, I have ADHD. You don't need to reveal your ADHD, ADHD diagnosis. Simply address the issue that is affecting you. Go to your boss and say, hey, you know what? I'm having trouble working with the noise here, or I'm having trouble with interruptions from some stuff, or I'm having trouble with the, whatever those things are. Address those issues and see if there is a, an accommodation to help you do that. And importantly, most accommodations cost little or nothing. Rearranging desks, getting headphones, uh, be, you know, getting permission to listen to music or whatever that is, changing your office mate. More free, here's the big one for 80 years, more frequent check-ins with your supervisor. Hey, listen, I want to check in with you more often because we 80 years tend to go off track. We tend to forget what our key core goals are in work. If you can always be touching base with your supervisor to say, what should I, now I'm working on this, right? That's the right thing to be working on, right? That is a hugely powerful thing. And then this is the, really the most important thing. It's not about I can't or I need help. You're, what you're saying is, you know what? I do best when there is no noise. I do best. And I used to leave uh, when I was at uh, the ad agency in New York City. Um, I would leave the office and go to uh, Starbucks or some other quieter, uh, quote unquote, quieter place. Um, there would still be kind of ambient noise, but it was quieter in terms of interruptions, et cetera. And my bosses were OK with that. So that's it on that. I want to thank you all for this. And I do want to make sure we have uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. I know that this uh, stops hard right at the top of the hour. Again, you can you can find me at addcrusher.com. There's a free ebook there. It's five things you're doing every day that make your ADAC worse. And I'll tell you, you're doing all five of them. Trust me, we all are, but you don't have to be doing all those things. Um, so with that, I guess we open it up to Q&A. Comments, thoughts? Thank you, Alan. That's just super. Uh, we do have some really interesting questions that I'd like to get to. The first one, real quick, is for ADHD people, is there a difference between a digital and a hard copy planner? Do you have a recommendation for one versus the other? I actually do, and I'm glad. That really is a great question. Uh, first of all, research tells us that when you write something with handwriting, it uh, helps you process the information better, and you're more likely to retain it. Typing or thumbing something into a device does not give you the same level of stickiness, of mental stickiness. So there's a research-based fact right there. But having said that, what I do, knowing that I have pretty bad ADHD, is I keep a, uh, a paper planner. It's By the way, it's called the Mona Planner, M-O-N-A-P-L, uh, Mona Planner. It's all one word. You go to monaplanner.com. It'll take you to monaregular.com. This is a gal that used to work for Franklin Covey. And she still, actually, she still works for them. But she found that their planners were so complicated because they had so many bells and whistles. So she invented her own. It's very simple. Now, I use that religiously, but I also back everything up digitally. So when I put some, an entry on my paper planner, I write it down. But then I also go into my iCal, my iPhone or my laptop base, um, and I t type in this so-and-so appointment. So I've got it in two places. Um, and then I make sure that my phone is syncing with my laptop so that there's never any dis discrepancy. You do those two things. Yes, it's a little bit laborious, but I guarantee when you give yourself the gift of doing that little bit of extra work, you're going to stop forgetting things. You're going to start showing up places on time and you're going to find yourself being more productive. Wonderful question. I'm, I'm glad I was able to, uh, to field it. Super. Uh, someone had a question about single tasking, multitasking, and their comment is, is they like to listen to podcasts, webinar recordings, et cetera, while they're working, or some people prefer music. Um, is this a bad idea? Everybody's different. Uh, some people um, work very well with music in the background. I'm actually a musician, so I can't. Um, when I hear music, I study the music. I I'm sitting there going, all right, what's the bass doing right now? All right, what's the, oh, that's an interesting thing to do. What a piece of crap song this is. So I can't do it. But uh, for if it works for you, then do it. And there's actually a hack that I think Tim Ferriss shares, that if you listen to the same song over and over again, um, your brain will start to tune it out and it'll put you in sort of a flow state. I don't know if it's true, but play around with stuff. And listen, if listening to a podcast, which is actual content rather than music, 
I don't know if I know that wouldn't work for me because I am either listening to the podcast or I'm doing the, the thinking working that I'm doing. If it, again, if it works for you, great. But my guess is that you are tr you are basically really multitasking then because your brain is trying to listen to that what that person is saying and also trying to listen to what your brain is saying about what you're trying to do. Okay, interesting question here. Um, sort of addresses the difference between single tasking and hyper focus. And the question sort of is how do you sort of distinguish between that in terms of, you know, if so a comment is taking an hour or more to write what should be a simple email or simple project. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, well there are a couple things going on in there. First of all, the idea of single tasking is an idea about choosing one, what you're going to be working on, and hopefully choosing something that is important, you know, a high priority thing, and then setting a time to hopefully be able to hyper focus on that. I mean, wouldn't it be great if when you did sit down to work on that tough email that you were able to hyper focus on it? Now, there are two things that, that came up in, in this question. One is hyper, hyper focusing in and of itself can be good. It can also be bad. And uh, the bad kind of hyperfocusing that we ADDers do is we will hyperfocus on some irrelevant thing, like oh, I've got to find that that so and so that somebody mentioned, even if it's you know s s somewhat relevant to your work or whatever. We will spend an hour and a half hyperfocusing on just trying to find that one little thing. But as Russell Barkley says, most of the time hyperfocusing is just procrastinating. It's going off in some irrelevant direction. And because it's easy work, and I get caught, I catch myself doing this a lot too, where I'll be searching for a certain image, and I'll just keep searching and searching, and I'll find that 20 minutes just got burned. You know what? If you can't find the image in 20 minutes, stop looking for it. Look for it somewhere else or whatever. But the other thing that came up in the question was, if I'm hyper-focusing on an email, and it's an email that should have taken 20 minutes to write, and I'm now spending 40 minutes on it because I'm hyper-focusing, that's not good hyper-focusing. That's called perfectionism. That is where you are doing a bunch of stuff to this email, if indeed it should only have taken 20 minutes, um, and you are trying to, to make this thing some kind of masterpiece. That's a whole other subject uh, unto itself. But uh, again, hyperfocusing can be good, can be bad. Okay. Uh, someone typed in, she has a job where she has to be interrupted, that she has to, and she has to deal with those interruptions. Uh, but and their comment is that they destroy her. Um, she notes that she's a pharmacist. Yep. What do you tell yes. someone who has to deal with interruptions? Yeah, and uh, a pharmacist, like a um, uh, a physician, or like someone who's in customer service, where the very nature of your job is interruption. That's a tough one. So the challenge then is to find some time. Um, outside of those interrupting uh, hours um, where you can do some single tasking, do a little bit of thinking. So it might be, as unsexy as this sounds, it might be getting up a little bit earlier, going to the office a little bit earlier. This was a big, big traction gainer for me, was starting to go into the office. I got there before the president of the agency would get there, and I was able to work without interruption for an hour. And just having an interruption-free hour makes the rest of your day so much better. So I know that's not a sexy answer, but uh, you sounds like you need to find some separate times to be able to do your single tasking. Okay, we have time for probably just like one more question. And I want to go back to single tasking. And so you say that figure out the single task item and you say sort of identify the three biggies and sort of allot the time for them. And then you tell us that with when these distractions occur that we label them as BS or important but not what I'm doing now. How do you deal with that important but not what I'm doing now versus biggie number two or biggie number three? Well, first, when you're single tasking, you're really only focused on one of your big three, right? Um, and, you know, ideally, as, as the, uh, the, the question, uh, uh, the person who put the question says is, you know, you're setting uh, uh, times for each of those. So you'd be setting a little bit of time. I'm going to single task on this biggie for 20 minutes between this hour and that hour. Then I'm going to work on this other one later on today, and I'm going to work on this other one uh, later on today. 
And what the not getting interrupted thing is about, the do what you're doing now is for anything that you've sat down to work on, whether it is biggie number one or biggie number two or biggie number three, just decide, I'm working on bigger biggie number one right now, and that's what I'm doing now. And then anything else is either going to be BS or it's going to be important, but it's still not what I'm doing now unless it's urgent. And then, of course, I got to go deal with it. So just keep applying this. And apply it again when you start working later in the day on your biggie number two. And if you just make a habit of this, you're going to start to see some real traction. And so is the takeaway from that that don't uh, don't schedule your biggie number one and your biggie number two to back to back, but allow time in between? That actually is an important thing. You do want to make sure that you have some recovery time between um, uh, important tasks. So if you're working hard on something for 20 minutes or 90 minutes, Make sure that you put a little padding in there. It says, look, i got to re-up my protein. I'm going to rest my mind a little bit. i probably got to return some phone calls or whatever. Absolutely. Switch, switch what you're working on for a while. Make sure that when you go into a single tasking session that you feel good, that you feel like you have some energy. Otherwise, again, you're just going to be pushing that boulder up a hill when you're in a weak time, and you're just going to get frustrated. Great. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. We could probably go on, but given the fact that we all have big things to move on to, we'll need to wrap it up right now. Alan, thank you so much for your time. This has just been super. Everybody, I just the number of comments that come in saying thank you, love it, it you rock. Uh, you really sort of addressed what uh, the folks online were listening to today and they really enjoyed it remind everybody uh, visit Alan's website addcrusher.com thank you all for your time and have a great afternoon bye now for more attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit visit attitudemag.com that's a d d i t u d e m a g dot com. Waiting on a tax return? Hopefully, it ends up in your hands. Fraudulent tax returns due to identity theft increased by thirty percent in twenty twenty three. If you're in a bind this tax season, LifeLock can help. Our U S based restoration specialists are experts dedicated to helping solve your identity theft issues. And all LifeLock plans are backed by the Million Dollar Protection Package. So we'll reimburse you up to the limits of your plan if you lose money due to identity theft. Help protect your information this tax season with LifeLock. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com slash aware.